Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Jason Huggins, and today I'm going to talk to you about um, application and infrastructure security, um, specifically talking about hardening Tomcat. Now, this is the first in a series of lectures we're going to do about security. Um, we've decided to start with hardening Tomcat so that we could give you the tools and techniques of something you can apply straight away, straight after the lecture as such. Um, we will have some other sessions, for example, Security 101, where we talk about more of the theory and things to consider um, putting into practice. Um, but this one is a much more practical session. Um, in the future, we'll also have other sessions covering IIS hardening, Apache hardening, and then more Uniface specifics around um, good practice on application design and architecture, things around the new Path Scrambler and the TLS functionality as that delivers and evolves. Okay, so um, basic agenda. Start with a small introduction about why we're here and why we're talking about security. We'll then go into the specifics of Tomcat hardening, and then finally we'll just look at other considerations. So why are we here? Well, security, it's all about confidentiality, integrity, and availability of your data. Now, the CIA triad is just one of the models out there. There are other acronyms with bigger circles and different um, representations. But at the basic level, CIA um, covers most of what we need to think about. Now, one of the things to consider with security is Risk avoidance, it's an admirable goal and what we need to aim for. However, 100% risk avoidance isn't possible. Um, um, you'd have to bury your machine in concrete, um, put it on an asteroid, and eject it out into space. It might then be vaguely secure. Um, one of the things that's a big risk for anything with IT is the human element. Um, we are not infallible. We make mistakes, and therefore we put our systems at risk. So what you need to consider is risk management, and it's basically a balancing act between the investment you make in terms of the cost, the impact of a security breach, the time it will take to recover, and what's mainly important here is the usability and acceptance. I mean, there's all sorts of elaborate um, security systems we can put, it, put in place, but if a user finds it too restrictive, for example, they've got to type in their password, scan their fingerprint, do an iris scan and speak into something and do a breath sample, they're probably not going to accept it. So you have to find that healthy balance. Do we need to worry about security? Well, we've probably all heard phrases such as these. It's an internal application. Our team's not going to attack it. Actually, we've never even had an attack. We're not that interesting to hackers. Our data's public record, so what can anybody do? I'm not on the web. I'm safe, et cetera, et cetera. We've all heard these phrases and similar. The last one, it's too complicated. Yet, yeah, the security realm can be complicated, but at each level, we have a responsibility to do what we can to secure our systems. And with a few simple steps, you can actually greatly improve the security of your systems. So, yeah, everyone does need to worry because attacks come from everywhere, whether they're from cyber criminals who are out to extort money from you or accidental hackers. And by that, I mean someone who doesn't even realize they're hacking. They mistype a URL, for example, enter the wrong data in Uniface terms, maybe do a wildcard retrieve by accident. All of those sorts of things can lead to problems which are unexpected, cause system downtime, cause data corruption and ultimately are all accidents, but it's things that we need to um, take into account. It's not just a privacy issue. I mean, when we think about security, we often say, oh, is my data secure? Can other people see it? But again, thinking back to the CIA triad, confidentiality, the C, is the privacy part, but above that, you've got integrity, so is the data actually um, what was stored and has it been um, intercepted on the way back and changed? So that's the integrity part. And also the availability. Um, we've all heard of things like denial of service attacks. Can I get to my data when I want it? Or can I get my data in a timely manner? So there's more to think about than just the privacy side. Security is a bigger concern and much more in the public domain these days because the way we interact with IT and our solutions interact is just 
ever more connected, ever more integrated, and therefore ever more exposed. Security, again, we often think it's just a web issue, but no, it applies to everything, whether we're talking desktop, web, mobile, or the various as a service um, things, so internet things, etc., etc. The key thing, as I say, is everyone must be aware at their levels. So when we're developing our solutions, we need to do what we can to make sure our levels are as secure as possible. We cannot rely on, for example, the firewall to take care of things or the infrastructure guy to take care of things or antivirus, etc., etc. They just are not the solution alone. Key thing is security is a complex thing and it's a multi-layer thing and it's only as strong as a weakest link so again as i say we're all responsible for making our layers as secure as we can again i said already firewalls antivirus etc the infrastructure guy building your networks are not the solution each of those have a responsibility to a certain aspect of security but ultimately when we're talking about applications if we're saying a web application or integration through REST or SOAP, then people are potentially connecting through um, an open channel anyway, for example, port 80. We've opened that on the firewall so people can get in and use your application. It's then the risk is what can they do to manipulate your application. So these things alone don't protect the layer we're um, working at. As said, it's not just applicable to web applications. Obviously, when I mention Tomcat, we instantly think of it's a web server, it's a servlet engine, it's dealing with um, websites. However, when we think about Uniface applications or applications in general, for Uniface, yep, web at the top with USPs or DSPs being served by Tomcat. Also, your desktop applications, for example, could have the HTML container. Again, the continent of that being served via Tomcat. Um, mobile is a hybrid or potentially a web solution, again, coming via Tomcat. And something that spans all three of these is the use of APIs. So whether that's SOAP, REST, UHTTP, doing some other protocol, um, all of those potentially come from a web app server, potentially via Tomcat. So all of these do need to be secured. So that's just a brief introduction. So if we now move on to the actual hardening of Tomcat, um, to start with, I can say that Tomcat is actually quite secure out of the box. Um, what, there's always things that can be done to improve um, the security, and what you'll see is ultimately it's a checklist of things we will walk through, we'll apply those, and it will greatly enhance the security of Tomcat. Um, but yeah, in general, Tomcat does start off quite secure. In terms of what is hardening, it's ultimately about enhancing your security. So closing loopholes, turning off things like developer options or debug options, making sure we don't volunteer um, too much information. For example, if we have an error page, we don't want that error page to tell us things like the IP address of the machine or the path of the files on the file system or what the actual underlying application server is. So we want to make sure we don't volunteer that information. Other things such as when you do a default install of Tomcat, it includes things like the management console and example apps and documentation. All of those things are um, items that don't need to be published in the production application. So we'd remove those. Again, also good practice naturally to patch things. Key thing here is that hardening is not um, an event. It's not a one-time thing you do when you deploy your solution. It's a process. It's an ongoing activity where you have to monitor changes in the industry, changes in security, changes in the available ciphers and encryption routines, and make sure you're always keeping things up to date. When we look at the architecture of Tomcat, it does look complicated at first glance, and it can be. What I really want to illustrate here is that, um, well, we have the main server Tomcat. Within that, we can have multiple services, which in themselves can contain multiple engines, so the web servers themselves. Each web server can have multiple hosts, um, so potentially covering multiple domains or multiple IP addresses um, across multiple network cards. Within each host, you can have multiple contexts, where each context is effectively your um, web application. And within that context, you can have multiple servlets, uh, for example, the WRD for USPs and DSPs, or the SRD for SOAP requests. 
And to each of those layers, you have multiple connectors. So we can see that I have the HAP connector, um, which allows me to connect things such as Apache or IIS to Tomcat. And then we have the normal SSL ports for secure communication and port 80 for regular HTTP communication. So there's lots of different angles um, we need to look at when we're securing um, Tomcat. Um, the key thing to bear in mind here, though, is that you do have multiple layers, and you will see this in use as I go through the demonstrations. Okay, so the first thing that we um, can do, and it's the um, one of the big ticket items in terms of securing Tomcat, is implement SSL. Now, this will deal with the confidentiality and the integrity, because ultimately your data will be encrypted, so it will mean nobody can just um, intercept the data, read it, or change it. So that's covering the C and the I. It has nothing to do with the availability side that we deal with in other ways. At a high level, SSL is about asynchronous, sorry, asymmetric encryption of the data, and that's based around public and private keys. Now, the key thing here is public keys are shared and used to encrypt the data, and private keys are kept secret and are used to decrypt the data. So when a server is sending information to a client, the client will have the public key of the server. The server will encrypt data with its private key, and it can then be decrypted with a public key. What that means is if someone was trying to impersonate the server, for example, they wouldn't have the private key, so they wouldn't be able to encrypt data in the same way. And the same works uh, vice versa. Now, Secure Socket Layer is, a, in a strange way, the wrong name for SSL. Um, SSL was the protocol being used and was the original protocol for doing um, Secure Socket Layer communication. However, it developed flaws and there were hacks, and it's been superseded with Transport Layer Security, so TLS. Overall in the industry, though, we still refer to doing this type of encryption and HTTPS as SSL. In terms of setting this up in Tomcat, it's actually quite a straightforward process. In Tomcat, first of all, we need to create a key store, and there's just a couple of command lines to create an empty key store, um, and I'll demonstrate this to you uh, later on. Um, the key tool is nothing special that you need to install. If you have the JDK or the JRE installed on your machine, which by default you have with Uniface anyway, then you will find the key tool in the bin directory of the JRE or the JDK. So you create your key store, and then what you need to do is add the certificates. Um, one, your certificate authority certificate. So this is the publisher or the signer of your certificate to validate that the certificate is genuine. And then you have to add your key pair. So that's the certificates that um, are associated with your uh, particular domain or your Tomcat server. Now, in terms of Tomcat, the thing to bear in mind is the certificate itself has to be in PKCS12 um, format. Um, it's just what it needs to be. And then importing that into the key store is just the command line you see there. No need to try and remember these command lines. They are well documented, and all of this information will be available to you at the end of the um, session. Now, something to bear in mind, which could be considered a small weakness, is that the certificates key and the key store passwords have to be the same, because at this time in Tomcat, there's only one password field, and it doesn't differentiate between the keys held in the key store or the key on the certificate. <clears throat> so once you've created your key store and imported um, your certificates into the key store, you just have to make a few changes to the Tomcat configuration to enable SSL. And the first of these is opening the server.xml file and basically uncommenting the SSL connector you'll see in there. Now, you'll see this when I open my file, and um, I'll demonstrate that to you shortly. What you then have to do is on that connector, you have to point it at your key store file by adding the attribute key store file and also add the attribute key store pass, which you specify the password of the key store. It's plain text, which is not ideal. Um, however, you just got to make sure people don't get onto that server. Um, what you then have to do is also add some ciphers. Now, there are um, a recommended set of ciphers, and these tend to change. What a cipher is, is the encryption algorithm that is used to encrypt the data that's moving backwards and forwards. 
when we talk about the SSL protocol or T, um, so SSL or TLS, what they are are the protocol in terms of the handshaking and the negotiation used to move the um, public keys backwards and forwards and also to determine which cipher is actually used. Now, again, you don't need to remember this list of ciphers. There's various resources um, on the Internet which will tell you what are the recommended ciphers to use, and I'll point you at a resource for that later on. Okay, so other changes we make to further secure the solution now. In server XML, um, well, first of all, we remove default applications. So if you've looked into Tomcat, you'll see you get things such as the examples, the documents, the host manager, and even the content of root um, presents much information um, about the actual um, app server. I mean, if I were to go to a site and see um, that it's Tomcat, if I were a hacker, I would then go onto Google and say, give me a list of all of the known hacks for Tomcat. So ultimately, I don't want to be volunteering that information. There's other things in there, such as the shutdown port. Um, this port basically allows you to send a particular message, i.e. shut down, to Tomcat on that particular port, and it will shut down Tomcat. You can imagine this could be utilized um, uh, in naughty ways, and that will lead to a denial of service. So again, when we think of the CIA triad, that's the availability part. This is one of the um, attacks that we can prevent just by changing that shutdown port to minus one. In terms of volunteering information, um, we add the attribute server equals just a blank string um, to ensure that uh, when information comes up in any error messages or when interrogating the server, that we don't, again, volunteer information. So you just add server equals blank to the connectors. Another thing we do is prevent malicious deployments. Um, something you will notice by default on your Tomcat um, site is if you package up your applications as uh, WAR files, by then deploying those into your um, Tomcat installation, it will then automatically unpack those um, archives and deploy the applications. That could be catastrophic if a hacker got onto your server and managed to uh, push one of their files to your machine. So one of the things to do is make sure that auto deployment is disabled and that's done with these two attributes, unpack WARS, you set to false, and auto deploy, you set to false. Another thing to do is make sure you remove unused connectors. So I mentioned earlier on that diagram, we have the AJP 1.3 connector, and that's used to allow things such as Apache or IIS to connect to, um, to Tomcat. Now, if you're not using those, there's no point having that listener because you're leaving an open listener and potentially a weak spot should people find vulnerabilities in the future. Another thing to do is to make sure you bind the connectors to the network cards you want people to listen on. So I mentioned that you could get hacks um, internally. Well, if this is not an internal facing application and you don't want people who are behind the firewall to be attacking um, the site directly, then you can just bind the address to the external facing IP address. So that can give you a level of security. Um, this also gives you abilities to segregate different parts of the system. But the key thing is, yeah, make sure you bind your connectors to the address um, in use. Again, it's just done with the address attribute. Okay, moving on to the web XML file um, at the top layer, so global configuration. A few things to change in there. Um, simple ones are reducing the number of default documents that are loaded. I mean, as you may know, if you don't specify a particular document when you go to a website, it will then look at the default list and try to load one of the defaults if it can find it. Again, you don't want default stuff um, kicking off unless you really need it. Where this could be a vulnerability is one of the standard includes with um, Tomcat is index.jsp. Now, that will run executable code potentially. So if someone could inject that file onto your machine, again, they could potentially take control. So you want to remove things like that from the welcome list. 
Another thing to do is force SSL and basically force SSL the whole time. Now, that might sound strange because in the early days of the web and with the encryption with uh, SSL and HTTPS, we were told to only encrypt the critical data, so things such as the login screens or credit card details, etc., etc. Other than that, when it's just main, mainstream information, we were told we don't need to worry about encrypting it. And the reason for that was it was always considered that um, SSL was anything up to 10 or 20 percent slower than just using straight HTTP. Things have dramatically changed in recent years, and I can illustrate this to you. Here's just a simple test site, and what this test site is doing is just loading 360 images, and they're not cached. This is over straight HTTP. Okay, took 8.5 seconds. Running exactly the same site over HTTPS is significantly quicker. I mean, 93% faster. Now, for us regular people looking at this, it looks like a lie. It doesn't make sense. However, if you Google why is HTTPS faster than HTTP, then there are lots of good explanations that will make this clear. Um, I can't um, explain that to you today because it will take too long. But it's to do with simply differences in protocols, differences in session handling, etc., etc. Again, if I go back to HTTP, again, you just see it is, well, relatively slow compared to HTTPS. So definitely worth forcing SSL because you're not going to see a performance de degradation on your apps. The only exception to that rule is if you're maybe using Internet Explorer 6, um, but any of the old browsers that don't necessarily support the newer protocols, the chances of you actually deploying to those are very low these days. Okay, again, in terms of um, reducing information exposure, something you can also do is change the generic error pages. So a common one we'll see here is 404, which is file not found. Again, maybe an attacker can't make much use of information about a file not being found, but there's no point letting them know that. Just have a generic error page. Again, 500 errors. That's the internal server error. You might decide, yeah, we don't want them to know that a particular action has caused an internal server error. What I tend to do is, in these actions, I will go to a generic page I've created, so in this case, error.htm, and I'll just say that anything I don't like is an internal server error, whether it's a file not found, whether it is a genuine internal server error, or any other scenario that I don't want the user doing. Okay, next. At the context level, the WebXML file, there's a couple of changes to make there. And when I talk about the context level WebXML, this is your individual Uniface um, web application. So this is in the WebXML of the WebInt folder. A couple of things in there to change. The first, again, is dealing with exposing information. And this is the testable um, attribute. When you have the testable attribute, you can call the WRD um, with an appropriate component name, and it will tell you what version the WRD is. Again, that may or may not be useful information for an attacker, but again, we shouldn't expose it. Because again, if I was an attacker and saw WRD version 10.1, then I would Google and say, what hacks are there for this version? So again, let's not show that information. So we set it to false. Another thing for just general good practice is having timeouts on your application. You might build these in at application level, but another thing to do is have it at infrastructure level. So here we just add a session timeout, and in this case, 20 minutes. So this goes into um, the web XML. At a global level, there's other changes we can make in the context.xml. First one of these is to say to use HTTP only um, for cookies. Now, this is different to the secure attribute. What this one is saying is only, um, well, basically, do not allow client-side interaction with cookies. I mean, a typical use of uh, cookies is 
for session state or managing um, the fact that it is a stateless environment. Most of the time, you don't actually need to access that information in the cookies. So best practice is not to allow the client or JavaScript to access um, the information in the cookies. What this does is basically then um, protects you from things such as um, cross-site scripting or to be more precise, cookie poisoning, where someone changes the value of the cookie and tries to manipulate your application by um, doing manipulations there. Or even worse, getting cookies from their site to come into your site. So this is something that um, we set at this level. Now, by default, Uniface actually sets this in the headers for you anyway, but as a developer, it is possible to disable that. So if you know your application shouldn't be allowing client-side access to cookies, then always set this. Another thing to do, you may or may not have noticed this in your Uniface installations, is disable the automatic reload and update of files. So what I mean there is if I'm changing the configuration, I don't want those to be reread automatically um, in production. If I'm making a change, then I should be scheduling downtime and restarting the server process. The risk here is if I don't disable this automatic reloading, is if a malicious attacker manages to get access to these files, they can change things and, again, take control of your machine. Okay, so those are the main hardening things. Now, specifically or more specifically towards web applications, using um, filters to rewrite the URLs can give a greatly enhanced level of security. Now, one of the things out there is that you shouldn't try to do security by obscurity because all you're doing there is just delaying the inevitable. But with the filter rewrite, you are able to uh, obscure the URLs, and further still, you are able to make it near impossible to call the original URLs. And I'll demonstrate that. Um, <clears throat> basically, you add the standard uh, Tomcat rewrite filter, and then you create a set of rules. And I've given some example rules here that will work against um, my uh, demonstration that I'll show to you, and to a certain extent can be easily adapted to work for um, any DSP applications. Um, at a very high level, I'll just talk about some of these rules, but I'll show it in the demonstration. But at the top level, I'm saying if I go to the URL and I specify talk as my um, resource, then talk will be mapped onto messenger slash WRD slash main. So that runs my main DSP. Um, the next two lines say, if my referrer isn't from my talk URL or isn't from the messenger application itself, so what I mean by referrer is I'm in the application and I've clicked a link to go somewhere else or taken an action. If those actions are coming from somewhere other than the context I expect, then generate my error page. Um, the next one is basically saying, for my uh, static resources, just redirect to the appropriate location. Um, the next one is dealing with the AJAX request, so the posts, the gets, um, whether that's from talk or from messenger. It's If you've dealt with regular expressions, these things will look quite familiar to you. Um, again, it's documented reasonably well out there, and once you start playing, you will pick up um, the process and see that you can adapt this to your um, particular applications. A few other things to consider, um, a bit more Uniface specific. Um, for anyone who has done um, Uniface web development, whether that's USP or DSP, you will see if you make the coding errors, for example, specifying the wrong component name, um, or even a component doesn't exist, or specify the wrong number of parameters or an operation, you'll normally get a yellow screen. Now, that's perfect for development because it gives you a whole load of information that basically tells you exactly what you've done wrong, so it's very easy to go and correct it. The problem with that is it's easy to um, exploit that and find out lots of information about what's being run. So with that, we have a number of logicals that... Um, allow you to basically change the content of that yellow screen and basically remove it and change it for something else. So again, I just replace it with my generic error page. The other type of error um, you can see is more to do with infrastructure or configuration errors. So those are the red error screens. Um, those are the ones that 
normally frustrate us as developers because it's is it a password expired has someone stopped the u router has someone killed my new server or is it crashed they can be um a little bit more frustrating as a developer however what again what we don't want to do is volunteer information to a potential hacker when they are trying to do things now to change these again is relatively straightforward um, under your context and your web in folder you would have noticed a folder called error underscore and the default is en so that's the locale and in there you'll see a set of templates which you can see based on that screenshot below that screenshot is volunteering a bit too much information and the dollar URD gets dynamically replaced at runtime to show particular or specific error messages so again you just go in and replace these templates with something else um, that doesn't volunteer information so overall it's only well a few steps that are mentioned but just taking these simple steps will greatly um, increase the security of um, your application so what I'll do is now demonstrate some of that Thank <laughs> you.